The Devils is Ken Russell's masterpiece. It highlights the corruption of religion through ignorance and greed, but who are the devils? In a film where it feels like as if every character is shown in their moments of sin, who truly is the devil in a sea of sinners? I want to start with Grandier, a man who dedicates his life to God, but sees the text of his Lord as a starting place. He's not a good guy. He seduces younger women from his congregation, only to leave them behind when they confess to him that he made them pregnant. That his larger sins come from his lust and sexual promiscuity, not taking responsibility for his actions. But how could he not? He's a man built in the image of God, being relatively attractive, especially since he lives in a society full of rotting people. Uh, the effect he has on the women in the society is shown through the nuns whose sexual repression leads them to stack on top of each other to form a pyramid just to get a peek at him. Uh, how could he not lust when he has his effect on all the young women inside the walls? While he lacks empathy for the women he entangles himself with, he still cares for the people of his congregation. Though he is a religious man, he allows the plague doctors to attempt to find a cure for the plague. But once he realizes the outrageous, inhumane treatment they are giving to the people, he lashes out against them. But while he has the courage to fight for these people, he also has empathy for them as he speaks to the ill lady as she's passing. Turn your face towards God, my daughter. Be glad. Be glad. You stand on the threshold of everlasting life. I envy you. I take this as he wants to leave the mortal plane. In this horror land of rotten death, he wants to be sent to his lord's paradise, but he doesn't want to leave his congregation that relies on him. That he is the one man strong enough to keep the people together. While the community is falling, he doesn't give up the sanctity of his mission. But Grandier is a godly man in that he's willing to forgive those of his sins. He understands the circumstances of the people. How can you live in this world and not sin? But this belief leads a man to disbelieve that purity can exist. This leads back to his relationships. That he doesn't see the deflowering of the young ladies as taking away their purity. That it would have happened regardless or their purity was already removed through their existence in this world. Even lilies decay into rottenness. Stop. But he contorts his religion using it to manipulate the women he's with. The confession scene shows this. Is he's harsh to the magistrate's daughter, telling her if God wants her to suffer, she should suffer gladly. But once he casts her away, he absolves her of her sins, as if he didn't want her to know that he used the pause in her speech to make her feel rotten for what she did, rather than the purpose of confession of giving her peace. But as Madeline tells Grandier her sins, he doesn't berate her, he absolves her of her sins to her face. Once she slips and admits that she loves him, he doesn't act out in anger, he closes his eyes almost in embarrassment, before telling her to go to his home. But this becomes blatant as the last older lady appears not knowing what sins she committed, so Grandier tells her, If you have forgotten, perhaps God has also. While Grandier may be manipulating people, he still is looking for love, which he finds in Madeline, but he's afraid, uh, afraid of what the community would think about him being with this young girl, but he doesn't fear what God would think about him being with Madeline. In the face of an actual pure being, he doesn't lust for her, but he falls in love for her. He prays to God that in the end, they could find a way to heaven together. There's another important scene where Grandier is questioned about having relationships as a priest, not if it's natural for a priest to marry, but if there's a religious rule which forbids him from marrying. How marriage is seen as a sacrament, and virginity is graced as a noble virtue. He who marries does a good thing, but he who remains chaste does something better, but Grandier responds. Then I am content merely to do a good thing, and leave the best to those that can face it. He carries on that he takes the words of his creator as his gospel, but he doesn't believe that it's good for men to be alone. This shows that he truly does care about the words of God, that he takes his religious framework and applies it to his life, but he doesn't believe he has to be perfect, in the same way the people around him commit sins and then come to the house of God to be absolved of their sins. He can too, he's a person, he walks on the same grounds as the people, he lives with the people, he attempts to help the people who are dealing with trouble in the congregation. He decides that he will marry Madeline, but in private he solemnizes his own ceremony, as he wants to marry her but without the consequence of public scrutiny. This is where the story leads to the false possession. 
Grandier understands the plot of the nuns, though he chooses to engage in sexual activity. Because Sister Jean is so sexually repressed, through giving herself fully to God, it leads her to want to give herself fully to a man. This explains the visions Jean has of Grandier in the place of Jesus on the cross, leading this repression to further and further torment her. Seeing Grandier gave her hope to find a man, but once she found out he was falling for Madeline, she only felt jealousy and anger that, in a way, Grandier possesses her thoughts. While he's a clever man, he still falls for the king's trick that he changed his mind about taking down the walls. Grandier sees this as a change of heart. He states that he was surprised something so important could be settled in such an easy fashion, but chalks this up to Richelieu convincing the king to spare the religious congregation, not seeing the larger cards at play, that they could eliminate him and then take the walls down when the central figure of their town is discarded. But this is happening as Grandier's true vision is shown to the audience. Having found his wife, he acknowledges his weakness and sin but wants to change for the better. That he wants to build his new self from the goodwill and wisdom of the people of Ludon. That he wants to fully live in the will of God, to cast off greed and dissension from entering Ludon. To make Ludon strong through the teaching of God. Ken Russell almost tactically shows Grandier's sins through the beginning of the film to build up the audience that the priest is acting in sin through his position as the mouthpiece of God for his community, that he is tricking the people of the church into thinking he is a godly man while he runs through the youth of the community. He's the devil controlling the people with his words of God. But this illusion is broken as the false prosecution of Grandier starts. It's shown that while he is false, he was acting in what he believed was ethical. In a sea of cinders, Grandier doesn't look so bad. So, if Grandier isn't the devil, then who is? My hump, take away my hump. Oh, Christ. Sister Jean, as the Reverend Mother of the Church, has power over the other nuns, which leads her to believe that she's the chosen one, that she's the leader of the women who give themselves to God. In this way, she feels superior as the nuns are stacked on top of each other to attempt to catch a glimpse of Father Grandier. They stop once they realize Sister Jean had noticed, afraid of her contempt, for she pushes the strictest aspects of nunhood upon the sisters, determining that they are not suited for the contemplative life, harshly punishing the girls for peeking out the window. Then, once the girl leaves, Jean goes into the secluded room with a window to peek out at the service. This shows us the first case of Sister Jeanine's jealousy, that as small of a thing as catching a glimpse of the man she wants causes her to lash out at the girl whose only crime was seeing what she saw in Grandier. Sister Jean, like all the other nuns, is incredibly sexually repressed, giving herself fully to God. Through this contemplation, it led her to feel as if she wanted to give herself fully to a man, with her thoughts focusing on Father Grandier, she has visions in which Jesus is replaced by Grandier, seeing him walk across a body of water, him in the place of Jesus during the crucifixion. In the same way that she thirsts for God, she connects these feelings to Grandier, seeing him give her hope that one day she could be with the man. She meets Madeline as she initially wanted to become a nun. She wanted to give herself to God, she saw it as her vocation. She jokes with Madeline, picking her apart, but eventually opens up to her about the real reason why many of the nuns remain. Most of the nuns here are noble women who have embraced the monastic life because there was not enough money at home to provide them with dowries. <laughs> or they were unmarriageable because ugly, a burden to the family. This puts it in perspective that many of the nuns don't choose this life, that they're forced into it. It's not that they chose chastity, but that life as a nun was better than what they could have outside the walls of the church. Since she gives up this information, it seems as if she's implying that she didn't choose to be a nun, but wound up as one out of circumstance. She decided to pick on Madeline because she feels lesser. That Madeline had a genuine interest in giving herself to the Lord, while she lacks the faith to have the same ambition, but is stuck in the monastic life, that her desire to be with the man clouds her ability to have the full faith Madeline showed. She wants to find a way to be with Grandier, so she decides to make him the new father, confessor for the nuns. This only furthers her infatuation with him. She starts to express her sexuality, firstly masturbating, but then self-flatulating. Uh, demonstrating that her sexuality is inextricably linked with pain, that her life has been full of pain through chastity, devoting all of her time to worship, that these connections get built such as the association between actions and sin, which lead her now to associate pain with sexual pleasure. 
But as this is happening, Grandier's marrying Madeline. Sister Janine doesn't find out until the other nuns joke about the marriage occurring. Now, knowing that she will never be with Grandier, she is stricken with anger, jealousy, and grief. While Madeline visits her the next day, she attacks her through the window. Dump it! Hypocrite! Tell me you have no vocation! Of course you have a vocation! Fornicator! Fornicator! Sacrilegious bitch! She becomes even angrier when she realizes the new spiritual director that was assigned his father Mignon, instead of Grandier. At this moment, she decides to destroy her life, claiming that Grandier has possessed her. She knew the trouble that making this accusation would bring, but didn't care as she was so jealous that if she couldn't be with Grandier, Madeline couldn't either. A public exorcism is set to rid Sister Jean of the demon. She tells Father Barre about the visions she had of a man, but they don't seem convinced that it's caused by possession. She is reminded that if she lies that her soul will be eternally damned, but she decides to lie. She can't help but laugh when she's whispering the falsehoods in Barre's ear. She states that she and the other nuns have been raped, basically. With this information, while still remaining unconvinced, they decide to determine if she's had sex. Blood can be seen covering the doctors performing the procedure. They say that they can determine that there has been fornication. Father Bari then decides to perform the exorcism. Sister Jean realizes that they were about to torture her as they believe a demon is inside of her, so she attempts to tell Father Bari that she has come to that. It is no longer the demon that's controlling her. She begs for mercy, but they ignore her. Once she is battered from the exorcism, they question her. She gives up that Father Grandier was the sorcerer that possessed her. Later, King Louis XIII shows Father Barre that he is a vial of blood of Jesus Christ. Barre decides to attempt to rid the nun of this possession with the relic, in particular Sister Jean. He puts it near her and she freaks out. Just to find out that it was nothing. Uh, Jean realized that her lies have just been shown in front of the audience of the townspeople. Jean is still further punished as those in power push to arrest Grandier. She explains that he is the five marks of the devil. Grandier exclaims that he may be a sinner, but he's not Satan's boy because he doesn't have humility. He tells her again that if her wish is fulfilled, that her soul will be eternally damned, but she doesn't react. This all lines up to show that she doesn't choose to believe in eternal damnation, that she doesn't believe in God, all of her thoughts have moved to jealousy, that she's trapped in the life of a nun, not able to be with the man, that in this life she's already damned to live a life of torment. But Grandier's words made her realize the wrong in her way, she decides that it would be best to off herself, but before she was hung the nuns cut her down from the tree. She then confesses to Father Mignon and Barret that Grandier was an innocent man, but the priests take it as the devil inside her attempting to defend Grandier that the exorcism had failed. As Grandier is being dragged to the fire pit, he has a chance to ask for forgiveness from the sisters, but he decides to ask God to forgive Sister Jean for what she's done in that moment. She realized the true beauty of Grandier, that he was a sinful man but a godly man, that he begged God to forgive the person who wrongfully sentenced him to death. That through the pain from the torture and the emotional torture of knowing you're gonna die, he stayed poised in his beliefs. That she realized the reason why God gave her these visions of Grandier was not because of his physical beauty which she had clinged to, but because of his courage and integrity. After his death, she starts purging her own devils. She has become addicted to being excised. I take this as she's hoping she was possessed rather than performing these actions out of her own free will, but then she is given one of Grandier's charred femur bones which she takes and starts masturbating with, so in a way her jealous rage led her to fully give herself to Grandier, just not while he was alive. Uh, Sister Jean was a sexually confused, repressed individual. She committed an act that I would believe is unforgivable, but this would have never happened unless the authorities hadn't pushed her. It's clear that her perspective changed near the end of the film, especially after she realized that her lies had become bigger than her. While Jean was a sinner, she wasn't the devil. Fortifications provide opportunities for Protestant uprising. Yes! While the entire film is masked in the story of possession, the two devils lie in the seats of power. The two men who control the destiny of all of France. Ken Russell brilliantly sneaks this fact in the film as the title of the devils is written along the screen in big red block letters. The two men who can be seen behind the text are King Louis III and Richelieu.
Throughout the entire film, these two men were attempting to gain control of the territory, as they denote in the pistol scene. Richelieu informs the king if he wanted to end the self-governance of the provincial towns of France, he would need to destroy their fortifications. While the king's men thought they would be able to walk in and take the wall down easily, they were stopped by Grandier. He was not civil in the way a priest would normally be thought. He threatened to blow the baron's head off if another stone fell from the wall, but this lack of civility comes from his drive to keep the community insulated. Seeing the wall surrounding them is the last thing separating this religious community from the wrath of the state. That he knows if the king wants to destroy the walls is for a reason. The people seem to understand as they initially stand behind it. Richelieu understands the power that Grandier holds within his community, so he attempts to pummel this into the king's head. Realizing they won't be able to get rid of the wall until Grandier is gone, his baron, the magistrate, and the plague doctors devise the plan to take these false possession accusations and use them to rid the town of their spiritual leader. Through this investigation, they try everything in their power to prove Grandier could possibly be the devil. Through this, they justify his execution. Just as Grandier gets burned at the stake, the baron nods his head to his men lined up along the wall. Multiple explosions sound as sections of the wall burst into pieces. The devils got their way. They killed the spiritual glue that was holding the city together. In his absence, they now took away the only fortifications that made them more than just a small farm town. At that moment, Grandier wasn't the real victim. The people of his congregation were. They lost everything, their self-governments, their security, now at the whim of the king and Richelieu. And all this film blew me away for the amount of shocking imagery. It really is something to say. Uh, this is a necessary story to tell. And I feel that the imagery truly meant something here. It wasn't made just to spark an emotional reaction from the audience, but the violence and sexual depictions were in extremes, in the same way that those who repress these feelings eventually were pushed to extremes when they let the emotions break open. Uh, I don't think the film's message would be as clear if the film was heavily censored in the way it was originally released in America, but that's all I have for y'all today. I uh, hope to see y'all next time.